And in that spirit of community, we're not done yet, folks. We will pray for one another. We will. And so when you came in, she got a little sheet, okay? And I asked you to do this. This is very accessible. You say, I'm not good at praying. I don't know what to say. You, it's all printed for you. So let's do this. Can I ask you to gather in groups of like three, okay? And gather in groups of three. And in a minute, I'll just ask you to do this. Ask you for the, introduce yourselves. Okay, introduce yourselves if you don't know each other. And in a moment, I just ask us to take turns praying each of these prayers for one another. So you, the first person can go and read the first prayer out loud, and that's a prayer for the person to your right, to your left, in front of you. Then the next person can go and read the next prayer, and just one after another, I invite you now to pray these prayers on behalf of those persons right in front of you. So introduce yourselves and invite you to now pray with your friends. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our knees before you. Every family in heaven on earth takes its name from you. And my prayer, Lord, our prayer, is that God may grant us that we might be strengthened in our inner being, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we might have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, and that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. Have a seat. Thank you all for participating in community and for praying for one another this morning. We continue in our um, series in chapel on all the world, our parish, loving our neighbors locally and globally. And um, in addition to that, let me, uh, I just remembered, we do have an opportunity for you to join us in prayer this Thursday uh, this, at noon in Emerson Hall as we participate in the National Day of Prayer. We're going to have, uh, we're going to, we at SP will be gathering for that. Back to our series. Uh, so in this series, we're engaging what it means for us to love our neighbors locally and globally. And I think there's very few who are more qualified to speak on this topic than our own Paul Kim. He's the coordinator for global involvement here at the John Perkins Center at SPU. Um, in this role, Reverend Kim advises SPRINT, and that stands for Seattle Pacific Reach Out International. And this is a ministry at SPU for students to learn and engage in holistic uh, ministry in global context. This year, Sprint is leading a trip to Barakia, uh, Colombia, and there the team will engage in social change through engaging the themes of community develop development, national and local social issues, and faith and social justice. Reverend Kim is an ordained ministry, minister in the, uh, in the Presbyterian Church of the USA, I get that right, and he's pastored congregations here in Seattle, New Jersey, and Michigan. And, you, and let me uh, give you a little preference. He's unfortunately kind of tweaked his back <laughs> this, this past weekend. And so if he's a little stiff, forgive him. Pray for this brother. But thank, let's give him a, a give, uh, welcome as he comes down. Yeah, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little stiff to begin with, but tweaking my back... Uh, a little bit more stiff, so yes, please, uh, please uh, forgive me. Thank you for the privilege to uh, come before you with a word, and in particular, I want to thank my colleagues, both students and staff, in the Office of University Ministries, the John Perkins Center, and Campus Ministries. Speaking of the John Perkins Center, uh, I don't know how 
I got stuck being the chapel speaker following Dr. Perkins <laughs> and Michael Emerson. Actually, I do know. I didn't, when I said yes, I didn't check my calendar. And I just said, sure, Bo, I'll do it. Um, this chapel space was packed uh, last week <laughs> for a wonderful conversation among uh, great minds uh, on the work of reconciliation. And I don't know how I follow that, so I'm just gonna do what I'm gonna do. Uh, I apologize ahead of time if my talk is not as enlightening. And I guess it should be said that if you came here to listen to Dr. Paul Kim, I'm not him. Uh, <laughs> we often get confused and our wives are really great friends and I've had dinner at his place before working at SPU and now we're at, at the same place. So, uh, but I'm not him, uh, sorry about that. But the good news is I won't grade you for anything that I talk about today. As we uh, go through the theme for this quarter, all the world might perish, loving your neighbors locally and globally. Uh, in thinking about this theme, I was reminded of the story of the Good Samaritan, and I'm pretty sure it's been preached, upon, preached on here in this chapel, but uh, I wanna talk about it again. It's obviously a story that if you've been in the church for any number of years, uh, you're familiar with, uh, but bear with me and um, follow. Uh, I'll read the passage and if you'll just follow along. It comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that same road, and when, we, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put on his own animal, put him, him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever you, more you have spent. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. While we don't know a whole lot about this beaten man, who remains, for all intents and purposes, anonymous, we know something about the other characters, and when those kind of details surface, we need to pay attention to that. Of course, we know that the one who had compassion and mercy on the beaten man was a Samaritan, and the ones who passed by were the priest and the Levite. And to this kind of question that this lawyer is asking, testing Jesus, the lawyer's question was, who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells this parable. And were we to answer the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, according to this story, the answer would be the beaten man, right? However, it's telling that Jesus' parable is not concerned with giving any identifying details about the beaten man. Why? Because Jesus is reframing the discussion or the question. Instead of concern to identify one's neighbor, Jesus asked, who was the neighbor? Or maybe to put another way, who was the neighbor for his neighbor? The question that Jesus is raising to the lawyer and to us is this, are you such a neighbor? 
In thinking about this, uh, our theme, loving your neighbor both locally and globally, the question that rises out of this passage is not who your neighbor is, but are you the neighbor in this world? And that's what I want to focus on today. Are you such a neighbor that Jesus calls us to be? It's not enough to be able to see that someone is your neighbor. This doesn't do much. At best, it distances ourselves from life of one another. One has to be a neighbor in order to love neighbor as ourselves. One has to be a neighbor in order to love neighbor as ourselves. As we think about the chapel theme, loving your neighbors locally and globally, I want to ask, are we the neighbor that Jesus calls us to be? Because if we're going to love our neighbors locally and globally, right next to us or far from us, we have to be the same, a neighbor. Question, how do we become this neighbor that Jesus calls us to be? I want to just talk about a few things. I know uh, in this passage, again, it's very familiar to us, and there's so much to unpack in this passage. But I want to talk about a few things. First, in becoming our neighbor, our theology has to be our practice. Our theology has to be our practice. As an advisor to Sprint Seattle Pacific Reach Out International, a program that gives the stu our students an opportunity to engage in issues of community development and social change in international context, I have to, I have to <laughs> attend a weekly meeting that we call AMC, ASSP Ministry Council, led by uh, our Vice President of Ministries, Katie Baumheckel. And one, one week, she asked this question. She always has this opening question for us. And one week, she asked this question. When do you feel most alive in Christ? When do you feel most alive in Christ? I thought about it, and I was trying to wrestle with that. When do I feel most alive in Christ? You know, I'm a pastor. I should have these answers ready. But I was struggling, and, you know, she goes around in a circle, and it was coming to me, and I was like, no, what do I talk about? And I realized, I have to admit, that I often feel the most alive in Christ when I am in other countries engaging with community and faith leaders. I was thinking about my journeys all over the world to meet pastors, church leaders, community leaders, doing significant work for the good of the people. And most recently, my trip to Colombia, South America, where, again, we will be sending our sprint team this year, this summer. And while several of us were there, there was actually, a, actually a, a group of us from SPU that were on this trip. While several of us were there meeting with our partners and seeing the, their work, what I was witnessing is the unfolding of God's work in a church immersed in the context of their community. As I reflected upon my own upbringing and our own context as the American church, or I should say the U.S. church, because the Colombians would say we're Americans too, we're just in the South. I had to admit that I wonder if in our ministry practice, if context is in the forefront or in the background, if it's at the heart of what we do, or if it's afterthought. What I saw in the leaders of Colombia were that they were not people who were passing by on the other side, because their theology was inextricably tied with their practice. To put another way, these Colombian leaders, their theology was their practice. Their practice was their theology. There was no separation. And it shouldn't escape our attention in our passage that the two folks that literally, literally distanced themselves from the unidentified beaten man on the side of the road, passing by on the other side, were two religious folk. Not only just people who went to temple, but people who were at the center of temple life, the priest and the Levite. And it gives me pause as I think about our faith community. Are we just as complicit in distancing, othering, and passing by on the other side? Over the weekend, a theological giant passed on, Dr. James Cone. And in the preface to his book, uh, 
the God of the oppressed. He says this, human beings are made for each other and no people can realize their full humanity except as they participate in its realization for others. I'm afraid that what we in the faith community talk about is just that, talk. Mere theological theory, not concerned with fully realizing the humanity of those around us. What Jesus is talking about in in a neighbor is getting real with our faith. That our work to make the gospel fully alive in this world is to participate in bringing our theology to practice for the realization of people's created humanity in God. That's what we believe in. And yet I wonder if the church community is complicit in passing by on the other side. One of the leaders in the Colombian Presbyterian Church that I got to meet, Herman Sarate, said this, the gospel is good news, not doctrine. The gospel is good news, not doctrine. If our gospel or our theology and our practice do not meet and do not match, what we have is mere doctrine. Has our gospel been good news to the oppressed? Does it bind up the brokenhearted? Does it proclaim liberty to captives? And does it provide release to prisoners? Does it? Or is it just mere doctrine? Is it mere scripture that we quote? Becoming a neighbor is disruptive to us, so you have to be willing. Asking the question, who is my neighbor, when the lawyer asks that question, who is my neighbor, is in a way an act of distancing oneself from the issues. It's a way of identifying those people. Instead, when Jesus asks who was the neighbor, what he does is to disrupt the status quo, indicting the church and even us for distancing and admonishing and admonishing the church uh, to borrow Brian Stevens's admonition to get proximate. What Jesus was doing was indicting us for our distancing act and us for uh, encouraging us to get proximate. I think getting proximate means that we have to disrupt ourselves and our propensity to hunker down behind our protective barriers, to be inconvenienced toward truth. Jessica Shea, who is a local business leader and a past chapel speaker, writes this in her chapel, or her blog. Um, She writes this, crossing the bridge, she's reflecting on, um, in her blog, she's reflecting on her experience of being an Asian American woman in the corporate world, in in the tech industry, in in management. And she's changed jobs and she's she's literally crossing bridges over over, um, to get to Seattle. And she writes this, crossing the bridge that separates me from those of a different ethnicity and culture takes effort. It disrupts my routine. But it's more than that, more than just the physical inconvenience. It means engaging a different culture. My heart, mind, and spirit have to be involved. Above all, I have to be open to this, my life mingling with theirs. So why go to the other side? Why not just stay where I am? Why disrupt my routine? It's far easier to stay with my tribe. It's far easier for us to stay within our own comfort zones of our tribes and our life. However, we can't expect to be a neighbor unless we take that first step. With the last name Kim, it's not hard to guess that I am Korean American. And for people of Korean descent, the news uh, this past week and weekend of the leaders of North and South Korea meeting and vowing to end the Korean War is incredible. Many things go through my head, but to be perfectly honest, I am unsure what I think will come about with, of all this. However, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because that there was, at the very least, 
a first step. In fact, each leader literally took their first steps across each other's borders. It's harder to do that than stand behind a bully, bully pulpit and claim all credit for this. The actual work of taking the step is harder than just talking about it. What are your disruptive first steps going to be? One of the first disruptive steps that I think Jesus was trying to get the lawyer to consider was a different reality than his own prejudice. I think the lawyer in the story, uh, the lawyer in relating to the story, I think he, he identifies mostly, most closely with the Levite and the priest, people at the center of the community life. And he probably had a latent racism and prejudice against the Samaritan character. However, at, by the end of the story, uh, by the end of the parable, he is forced to admit, although he seems unwilling to actually say the word, Samaritan, that it was in fact the Samaritan who was able and willing to show mercy. Of all the characters, it was the Samaritan who showed mercy. And lift, in lifting up the Samaritan, Jesus signals to the crowd that God works in people's lives and places other than our pre preconceived ways. And this is important missiologically as well especially as I, as I help our Sprint students think about traveling internationally, both representing the church and representing SPU, it is incumbent upon me to help them to understand that as they enter other cultures, that they know that they are not taking God there, that Jesus has already worked in those places, and I dare say even more powerfully than in our own homes. We have to take the first step in dismantling even our own prejudices, even our own preconceived notions. To become a neighbor, you have to be willing to do the hard work of that. Um, today is May 1st, and uh, exactly from a, a week from today is my son Aaron's first birthday. And, uh, as I, and, and my sister just had her baby last night, late last night. So it's kind of a crazy time in my, own, in my mind. It's just like, what's going on? Bringing up all these new uh, thought, uh, memories of the hospital, because they gave birth in the same floor, same hospital. I was waiting in the same waiting room. All of, it's just lots of things, right? And, and I, I'm recalling calling our journey to pregnancy and, and um, the nine or 10 months before Aaron was born. And I, as a man, I can't say a whole lot about what it feels like to be pregnant. I can't say what it feels like to have morning sickness, evening sickness, midnight sickness, sickness here and there and everywhere. I don't know much about that. I don't know what it feels like to have a life being formed in my own body. I don't know what it feels like as a man um, that act of giving birth. I was next to it happening and I couldn't believe it was happening, but I can't possibly know what that's like. But there is one thing I do know, that the hard work starts after the birth. That, that's when a lot of things get really real. <laughs> like really real. I know it's, it doesn't make any sense, but if you're a parent, I think you know what I'm talking about. That that's when the hard work begins. The church, maybe because we are a people of hope, likes to live in pregnancy. Likes to live in potential likes to live in unrealized hope. But if we are going to live out this gospel, to be a good neighbor in this world, we have to do the hard work of raising our children, raising our church to be the neighbor that this world needs. We can't stay pregnant forever. 
At some point, we have to give birth to what Jesus calls us to be and to do. When Jesus said to the lawyer, go and do likewise, I don't think Jesus thought it would be easy for the lawyer. In the same way, in order to become a neighbor, you have to be willing to do the hard work. I have to be willing to be, uh, do the hard work of being a neighbor in this world. If we go on and continue without being the neighbor that Jesus calls us to be, then our quote-unquote making the disciples of all nations and our quote-unquote engaging the culture and changing the world will be the motto of the colonizer rather than the one working towards shalom. Our theology and our missiology will be mismatched if we are not connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ Jesus, who became beat, the beaten man, in fact, for, for our own sake. Now, we can opt out of engagement. We can stay on our phones and let Facebook predetermine our daily and hourly interactions with the people of our own likeness and the things for which we have an affinity. Or we can do the work, the sometimes and oftentimes hard work of becoming the neighbor that Jesus calls us to be. Go and do likewise. Be a neighbor in this world, that from the valley to the mountaintops, in our homes and on our streets, we will see, that people will see, God is good in this world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here in this place. And as you send us out, send us out, send us out as good neighbors neighbors in this world, to do the hard work of living fully alive, being fully alive to your gospel in this place. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can we thank Pastor Paul? <clears throat> Would you rise for the benediction? And feel free to stay afterwards uh, for our closing song, but if you have to go, we understand. Now receive the benediction. But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his, his glory with rejoicing, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.